One day, they will all come to my funeral just to make sure that I stay dead. But today is not that day. I'm alive. My heart is still beating and I'm breathing. Fresh air for the first time in a long time. My name is John. Lastly, I am on a mission. Reclaim my soul. And I know I'm not the only one who thinks, you know, it's about time this industry got a facelift. Make no mistake about it, this is an official declaration of war tonight. Anyone get in my way? Knock the pills of this industry on their ass. We're in history books anymore, baby. We writing them. That were the first remarks from one Jonathan Good, aka John Moxley, aka formerly known as Dean Ambrose, right after AEW Double or Nothing last Saturday night. What is going on, everybody? It's the France, and we're here on a special Sunday part two to Unscripted, as it was so much news coming out of AEW Double or Nothing, as well as Tom, um, John Moxley talking to Talk is Jericho. And a couple of the podcasts on his experience and his time in the WWE and his goals going forward. And I could not keep it to one show because I wanted to get this all down to one show itself. This I don't expect to see this every single week, every single time now. It's just this is that special time. This was, it, this show, AEW, was awesome. It, was, it is a paradigm shift, as he said in that clip right there. He is finally got his, he's reclaiming his soul. He's able to do what he wants to do now. He gets to go out there and show us what he, what WWE would not allow him to do. John Moxley is going to be in one, and not even in like, in a four minute clip, in a four minute video on YouTube, which of course is the attack of his debut in AEW. He, be, he was more over in that video than he was in anything he did in WWE after the Shield broke up. And as he talked about in the Chris Jericho podcast, and we'll get into a lot of it tonight, today, he knew that well, WWE had no plans for him when the Shield broke up. It was Seth. It was He was always the third wheel. They never expected him to get over. But he didn't get punished like most. They actually ran with him for a minute. Moxley showed up at the close of AEW Double or Nothing where he took out both Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, and a referee. Jericho defeated Omega face Adam Page at AEW's All Out. We'll talk about that later. President Tony Khan, con con confirmed that Moxley has signed a multi-year deal with the company after the show went off the air. He is in, he is a multi -year, he has a multi year contract. He will be on a full time on a full time deal. Con confirmed. When we go weekly, he's going to be full time. Same as some of the other guys. Especially when the schedule is light, I'm open to him working some international indie dates. He is full time with us domestically. Essentially, essentially, he's our guy. Yeah, he's going to do some international and indie stuff, but he's definitely an AEW full time wrestler. As we talked about yesterday, Vince McMahon and WWE were pissed. Vince McMahon was caught off guard. Vince McMahon thought how Vince McMahon thought stupid so so stupidly that this guy was just burned out, was gonna go to Hollywood and do movies and come back. It is baffling. It's just baffling that he would even think that, that that's what this guy wants. Yeah, I can believe John Moxley, Jonathan Good being burnt out after what he talked about on Talk to Jericho and everything that he had to go through, I would be burnt out too. Coming out of double, coming out of a six-year run, a six or seven-year run, on pretty much at the top of the food chain, and everything that you wanted to do always getting changed, always getting rewritten. Vince McMahon just going in there and saying, "Well, we're going to change it. We're going to change it. No problem about that. We're going to change it." Oh, you, you, and oh, it's just good shit. Everything that we do here is good shit. No, I would be burnt out. I'm, I am surprised. Now, I figured he was going to show up at double. I didn't. I, did, I thought 
when the all out card came up, I was like, that's going to be a great place to um, debut John Moxley. This guy is going to want to have, I'm sure, with everything he went through with WWE, he's going to want to have at least two or three months off of wrestling and just, you know, rest, recuperate. Maybe he talked to Tony Khan after his contract was up and he would go off to do what he do, you know, anything they want. I know he's filming, filming a movie called Cage Fighter, so I figured that would go through. He would go and do the filming for that. And then when All Out comes around, that would be huge if he was like a mystery opponent for somebody on that show. But no, he made, I was not, I was, I was shocked, but I wasn't completely shocked because, yes, it's a big thing for AEW. It was that last thing that we were looking at on last Saturday when we came out of Double or Nothing. It was like, that was the last thing to go, bam, these guys are the real deal. Yes, they got TV. Yes, they have, like, Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, Cody Rhodes. But they needed that last punch to the gut. John Moxley making his debut was that punch to the gut. I'm, uh, I'm not on the CM Punk bandwagon. I really don't give a shit if CM Punk shows up. He's, it's just, he, like, people are like, oh, he's going to be the only person who can move the needle. I don't think so. I think Punk's time at being somebody who can move the needle is over. It's been five years, just let it go. He doesn't want to come back. He seems to be having a good old time calling fights for a, for a CFFC. I think it's um, the, the, some CFFC. I don't remember what the name of it is. But he's having fun doing that. He actually sounds like he's enjoying it. So let the guy be. Not for the CM Punk chance. They got their guy in John Moxley. Speaking of his breakout from WWE, who directed the John Moxley Prison Break video? John Moxley revealed during his appearance on the latest edition of Talk is Jericho that former deathmatch wrestler Sick Nick Mondo was the director of his infamous Prison Break viral video, which dropped on May 1st, 2019 at I believe, I didn't have, I think my internet was out that, mo- that night, so I didn't see what happened until the next day. I come up and I'm seeing like John Moxley. I'm like, like I see all this shit. And I'm like, what's going on? And then I look and I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Wrestling can, can also confirm that Mondo directed Moxley's recent Times Up video reveal for New Japan Pro Wrestling, which you can watch in a watch on, I believe, on YouTube or on Twitter. I uh, guess he, I mean, yeah, on Twitter he did. Um, what was it? He did retweet a video that. New Japan put out for it on Twitter. So if you don't want like know where to find it, and you are following John Moxley. I believe you can see it at Times Up video. The video is also included on Moxley's website as well as NJPW's YouTube page. There you go. Moxley had the idea for the original promo video when he knew what he would be when that he would be leaving WWE. Moxley said that all the people that he knew were good with video production were in WWE. He decided to contact Moxley. Friend with him, who he is friends with because he knew Mondo created the docudrama The Trade. Mondo gave his idea for the trailer and created a treatment for it and was immediately hired. The video was filmed in Los Angeles and cost $8,000 to produce. If you can, I'm, I'm just going to say this. If you can produce a video that good on, a, on um, only $8,000, well worth it. Worth every single penny. That was an awesome looking video. According to Moxley, the promo was shot over a two-day period in, the, in February when he was under contract to WWE. During filming, Moxley recalled receiving a message from Vince. He said, and I quote, Vince texted me at what would have been 4 a.m. This, his time while I was filming this, which would have been probably 1 o'clock in the morning if it was in California. Jericho recalled, uh, Moxley recalled, he tried to get me to extend my contract to do the European tour in May, which would have been this past month. He said, hey, pal, hey, pal, I need a favor. The biggest box office we, can ha- we, we would have would be the Shield's last run through Europe. Moxley said, said he briefly considered it before turning the quest down. He said, again, now, now you want a favor from me. But a few months ago, that wasn't how you wanted it to go. It's not like you're going to put me on, out on WrestleMania, do some angle that's going to follow up on the tour. So I'm like, no, screw you. You want to do that? Your brutal. You want me to do your brutal post mania tour? Call Dave. Call Triple H. Call Brock. Call somebody else. I ain't your Huckleberry this time. Moxie said that his actual response was more diplomatic and technically the truth. 
Moxley informed Vince that he was committed to a film project, which was getting the promo released exactly midnight on May 1st, when his contract with the WWE expired. Moxley added that he had he has more projects in early stages with Mondo. Apparently, like Mondo pulled out a video, like they're going to be doing a movie. Him and Mondo are actually been doing. I think it's Cage Fighter, but I'm pretty sure it's something else. But hey, WWE should have treated this guy much, much better. This is this is Vince McMahon's fault. This is Vince McMahon's fault. He is not going to be the only one to do this, and I'll talk about it later. But John Moxley did what he needed to do to get out. He did everything the right way. And honestly, as I believe I said last night, yesterday, Tommy Dreamer and Bully Ray said the same thing. You need to just wait your contract out. Do what you are asked to. Get those. Get that contract done and like just ride out your ride out your time. If they offer you a contract but you want to leave, just say no. I'm signing. And just deal with it. They'll job you out to people who want to stay. He did the right thing. And Sick Nick Mongo, you can go find him out. And that. John Moxley details why he left WWE. This is the huge stuff. John Moxley appeared on Chris Jericho's podcast, Talk to Jericho, this past Wednesday. The episode was recorded a couple of days. It, it's after Double or Nothing, I'm pretty sure, because they do mention about Double or Nothing already happening. Moxie said it was time to talk, finally. He said that he has been quiet the last few months, even though WWE had sent out press releases and mentioned on commentary that he was leaving, which they have not done to anybody. A lot, Dave Meltzer did talk about, I believe, in February or January that WWE is doing all this. This could be wrong. But doing all this to try and convince him that, hey, you should stay, sign your contract, and we'll push you to the moon. Moxie brought up that his only real comment about leaving was during the Shield's interview with Michael Cole last month, and that it was because he felt like he was being set up with, up with them saying he couldn't hack it in WWE, so he'd be going to the minor leagues. I could see WWE doing that. They were asking Roman. Like, Cole was directing a question to Roman, and I guarantee you the last thing that he would have asked is, Roman, do you think Dean Ambrose can't hack it in WWE? That's why he wants to go back to the minor leagues. I guarantee you that's what he was saying. Moxley knows that he's never been happier and that the weight of the world has been lifting off of his shoulders. He said that he has nothing but gratitude for WWE and that WWE changed his life. He said he grew up as a person there and learned a lot of life skills, adding that he got a chance to be part of great causes like Make-A-Wish. Moxley also noted that he met his wife when they were young in the WWE and that the last eight years could have been, could not have been more successful. With that out of the way, let's bury the company, he said jokingly. I don't think he was joking. Moxley knew he wanted to leave the company in July 2018 when he was out with a tricep injury. He was supposed to be out for four months, but it turned out to be nine because of all the complications. Moxley said he didn't want to walk out of the company at any time, partly because his wife works there and he would get all the uh, all of his all of his royalties if he waited until his contract expired passed on April 30th. Yeah, if he he kept he walked out he left on on his contract date. So if they want to do a best of the Shield DVD, if they want to do anything that has to do with the Shield, they have to pay him royalties no matter what. Moxley recalled once getting a scripted promo about him describing the things that he did getting to the arena that day. He said that they weren't things that a cool or person does, but things that an idiot would do, like drive backwards on a street or eating pizza with a homeless person. Moxley refused to do the promo and asked for it to be. Vince redid the promo, put, put all of the material back in. Moxley met with Vince, who thought it, that it was such good shit. Oh, it's such good shit. It's what makes it, 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 that is why people like you. It's, so I'm an idiot. Vince said, ha, ha, ha. No, that's you. You're different. No money who is cool is going to say, oh, yeah, you know what I did today? I ate pizza with the homeless man. I drove my fucking car backwards, or I drove a tricycle backwards. No, that's somebody who says, hey, look, I'm a fucking idiot. I ate pizza with the homeless man because, hey, I can. Or, hey, I drove my car backwards because I felt like it. That is fucking stupid. This just, this entire interview, this whole Talk is Joker podcast is completely John Moxley exposing WWE and Vince McMahon for how stupid they are. Vince McMahon does not see anybody as anything more than idiots. 
Dusty Rhodes was, I forgot to grab that part of the article, uh, an article. Dusty Rhodes saw Dean Ambrose as the coolest thing, as coolest, like the, new, the cool new kid. Vince McMahon saw him as an idiot. He said that himself. He went on to recall the day when he started to count down the number of days to, that he had left. Moxley was back from injury last fall and was working as a heel against Seth Rollins, and as soon as he got to TV, several writers, writers approached him with scripts. The theme was that Rollins would be calling him out into the ring throughout the night, and that he would have various promos on the screen before leading to a fight at the end of the show. He knew it was going to be a long day with various promos, noting three tapes can take up to 40 minutes. <sighs> They, had, they hand me these scripts, Moxley recap. To my eye, it's typical WWE script. A bunch of words, a bunch of big words, a bunch of goofy words, none of any sense to me. We're not trying to tell any tangible story or do anything to get any kind of characters over. Nothing that makes any sense to me so typical. Yeah, the problem with scripting promos is that you don't get a pipe bomb. You don't get the hard times promo that Dusty Rose did in WCW. You don't get the, with the tear in my eye promo from the Royal when, when Ric Flair won the WWF Championship in, in the Royal Rumble itself in the post-match promo. That wasn't scripted. That was from Ric Flair. You don't get Austin 316. You don't get these memorable promos and it's like, yeah, I know who cut that. I know when it was and where it was. You don't get that anymore in WWE. Everything is just go out there, say a bunch of words just to try and get heat or get a fucking cheap pop. It's get cheap heat or get cheap pop. A cheap pop. Nothing tangible anymore. Moxley said the promo he was most concerned about was at the end of the show in the ring, which he felt was absolute hot garbage off a of, uh, uh, hot garbage out of of a crap. The gist was that the people were smelly and foul, and Moxley could see Vince enjoying it. The thing caught the thing that caught his eye the most was a comment about a pooper scooper. Moxley said he wasn't going to say that. There was a, was a process. They had to go to to get it changed, but without having men see it, because Vince would love it. Love the Poopa Scooper line. One of the writers tried to get the change to be more about needing gas masks because the town was disgusting. Moxie told a writer that it would be much better if they were trying to tell a story instead of saying stupid things. Later that evening, he got notes from Vince who said that Dean needs to understand why he's insulting the audience and read the, pro the promo verbatim and not try to rewrite it. Dean needs to understand why he's insulting the audience. I'm a heel. I came out the night after the night my best one of my best friends um, announced that he has leukemia, and I turned my back on my other best friend. The fans should hate me no matter what I fucking say, but there's no reason for me to say, "Oh, I, the fans smell. They're smelling. What does that smell?" That was. The he came out with a handkerchief and hide it against his face. He's like, what is that smell? And put it against his face. And he's like, this is stupid. This is not good. A wrestler, a person, a, like, he needs to understand why he's insulting the audience and read the promo verbatim. That is your problem right there. He should always, like, he knows why he's insulting the crowd. You don't have to sit there and say, oh, the crowd's smelly, the crowd sucks. It shouldn't be about attacking the crowd. His promos should be about attacking D Seth Rollins. The crowd doesn't fucking matter in this promo. It should be about Seth Rollins. Or Roman Reigns if you want to go there, and we'll talk about it in a second. He asked, why do I work here? Good question. Why does anybody fucking work there if everything you have to say comes from Vince McMahon's thoughts instead of your own? Well, um, I'm a professional wrestler who can tell stories and come up with promos. I believe I have the capability to talk to people in the buildings. I believe that I have developed those skills years ago, and once you bring them here to WWE, you just want me to say your stupid line? If you want somebody to read a stupid line, hire a fucking actor, because they would probably do a better job. Professional wrestlers do not need scripts. Professional wrestlers, if you have the skills, are going to go out there and talk people into the building to A, get, talk people into the building to A, see me get my ass kicked, or B, if I'm a babyface, see me kick the bad guy's ass. That is all you need. You don't need this stupid shit. Like, oh, why the, what does that smell? You people are disgusting. Oh, I wouldn't bring a pooper scooper out here. Suffer can suck a tash. Stupid shit like that. It's pathetic. I'm not interested in, do in doing it. 
He still is hoping that this, his version of the promo got through before the Pooper Scooper promo. He said that the one of the one of the promos that day had a distasteful remark about his friend Roman Reigns, who was recovering from leukemia. Moxie said that he thought it was a mistake and the Raiders pushed him to say it. Moxie went ahead and said the promo and regretted it as soon as he as soon as he said the line. Moxie went back into the writing's room and they were able to get the, their version of the promo in before the Pooper Scooper got to Vince. Bear in mind, this is a billion dollar company run by a man who, alleged, who is allegedly a genius, Moxie said. And keep in mind, in mind that we're all adults and we're talking about stuff like this. Yes, everybody outside of Vince McMahon and his yes men are adults. Everybody outside of Vince McMahon and, um, and, and his yes men know how to actually speak. Vince McMahon is a fucking child. He is a 74 plus year, plus year old child. Two things. Pissing jokes, toilet humor is fucking hilarious. It's not. It never it's this isn't the nineteen sixties, Vince. Toilet humor is not funny. Br Vince McMahon on a weekly basis writes a script, writes writes a show, and thinks everything that's on there is gold. He thinks everything that goes out there is just one hundred percent grade gold. Moxley then Oh, let's see. A new promo was written by Vince, which had Moxley in a surgical mask, followed by a gas mask the following week, and a full hazmat suit the week after. Moxley went into Vince and felt exhausted not just about the day, but the six years of explaining to an old man why the material was bad. They came to a compromise when Moxley wore a handkerchief instead. Moxley said he had no creative license in just doing terrible crap. Moxley took off the rate. After the, right off, right off, right after the show, had a drink and recalled what a waste of time the ordeal was. Basically, going into Monday Night and SmackDown Night every single week, unless, like, no matter who you are, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time, your day, your month, your week, your years, just going in there to cut promos that Vince McMahon thinks is funny. Vince McMahon thinks is, oh, it's good shit. It's good shit. It's going to get over. You're going to get heat. No, you're going to get the cheap heat that is there for about two seconds and then it goes away. People are like, ugh, again? Oh, you're doing this again? Ugh. Just imagine what Baron Corbin has to go through. Because Baron Corbin in NXT was a heel who got natural heat. That guy, all he had to do was just stand there and bask in the fans as they booed him and showered him in booze. The guy had real heat back in NXT. Nowadays, it's just go the fuck away. We don't want you heat. And it's not good. Moxley rejected the notion... The notion that talent are afraid today are afraid to go off the script and get or get fired. He said that he's never been afraid to get fired and has always gone in and gives his opinion. He said that he tries to convince the company that his ideas are better, but if he can't, then he goes he goes with the, what's the script what's scripted because they sign his paycheck and he tries to make the best he can. Now, I'm going to disagree with Moxley a little bit here. Yeah, he ain't afraid to get fired, but not everybody was in the position that you were in. Rusev never was a main event caliber player. Nakamura was for a minute, but he isn't anymore. A guy like, um, like, uh, Zack Ryder never had that, like, Zack Ryder was never in a position to where he, like, if he wanted, see, Zack Ryder, Kurt Hawkins, guys like that, Apollo Crews, they don't, they, they've never been in your position. Now, yeah, he's not afraid to get fired because he'll go in and do what he can, but there's some people I'm probably sure on in this roster who are like, I'm afraid to get fired because... But here's the thing. With the fact that WWE is firing anybody, if people are afraid to get fired, stop being afraid to get fired because Vince isn't going to fire you. Vince doesn't want to fire an Apollo Crews and have Uwa Nation show up in AEW or Uwa Nation show up in Ring of Honor. Or have same um, El Generico show up in uh, Ring of Honor, or El Generico show up in New Japan. He doesn't want Kevin Steen to come back. He doesn't want a um, Austin Creed to show up outside of Up Up Down Down. If you're afraid to get fired, you might as well let that fear go away because WWE isn't firing anybody anymore. They don't want a Mercedes to show up in NXT or in WWE in, in AEW or Heidi Lovelace or. Um, the Vita Rose show up in an, in AEW. Yes, I got those right. That would be Sasha Banks, Bailey, and and uh, Ruby Riot. 
Monty didn't discuss the day when he knew 100% that he was gone from the company. He said he thought about walking out, but he didn't. This was the angle where he got shots and vaccinated during a backstage promo. He got to the arena and was starting at the pro, standing at the pro, seething during a sexual harassment meeting that the talent needed to attend. This was probably after the Tony Storm incident or when somebody else got the um, that, like p- private pictures leaked because last year going into this year, there was a couple times when like Tony Storm and others had the like new pictures leak. Not gonna go into that right now. After the meeting, Vince wanted to meet with him over the promo because he wanted to make sure that ensure that it wasn't played for comedy. Vince met with Moxley and said that the promo was so well written and will get him a ton of heat. Moxley said that it will do whatever he can to make it good and felt that it would be time he would say it again. Vince loved the segment. Yeah, it got him zero heat, and by this time that the promo came out, nobody gave a fuck about John, Mo- John Dean Ambrose's heel turn. Everybody watched that, and honestly, nobody cared anymore. It was a terrible fucking uh, promo. It was prop comedy at its very low. It was not what it was. Written, I guess it was written as best as it can be. If you want to have someone do kind of vaccination things, then I guess I know. I know John Ma- Dean Ambrose tried his best to make that as serious as can be, but nobody cared. I remember watching that episode, and I'm like, if I was in your position, I would want to leave then, too. 110%. You're going to have me go do that shit? I'm out of here. Moxley noted that the day he felt... That day, he felt that he could not work there. He left the airport feeling depressed. The promo also had a line about actual friends who was going through leukemia that Vince wanted me to stay. That he tried to talk me into saying, Moxley stated, this is where I absolutely drew the line. I said, absolutely not. Moxie said that Vince tried to talk him into it, and he would not. It's the, it is the worst line, Moxie Mobile. I'm not going to say it on the end. I'll tell you after we're done. It would have been like a thing where someone would have been, got, had to get fired. Maybe me. They may have lost like sponsors like Susan E. Coleman and all of that. I'm, gl- I'm glad he didn't say it because that just shows that he's a bigger man than Vince McMahon. I, I, this, is what, this is what anybody who doesn't want to do anything should do. Vince McMahon has come out and stated this multiple times. He will never make, your, make a superstar do something he would not do himself. Next time somebody pull, like he tries to pull this shit, you should go up to Vince McMahon and be like, listen, you have come out and told, told people, you would not make me do anything you wouldn't do yourself. I want you to go out there in front of the audience, and I want you to say that promo. Because if you say that promo... And things are okay, I will say that promo. If you say something like that, then I will say that promo. But I'm not doing it because it's not a good idea. If you think it's a good idea, you go and do it. You have told us time and time again that you would not have us do anything that you would not, you would not do yourself. That's how you get that to happen. Moxie said he would have left WWE even if there was no other option. He did also say, I don't know who wrote it, I don't know if it was Vince himself, if it was a writer, he was, and you're listening right now, you should be ashamed of yourself. You wouldn't believe it. And this is the kicker right here, I just said it, but this is the kicker. He said he would have left WWE even if there was no other w, um, US option. John Moxley, Dean Ambrose, was leaving WWE no matter what. He was leaving before AEW was even a thing. When did Doc Moxley tell WWE he was leaving? Moxley is the latest superstar and latest wrestling promotion as he officially joined AEW last week. This is what I told Vince and, Hun- Vince and Hunter. This is not a decision I came as fast or lightly. This has been a long time coming. I'm not going to change my mind. This is not about one particular thing. This is not about an emotional decision. This is happening. I'm leaving, I'm leaving, and it's okay. It was around Rumble that Moxley told WWE that he was leaving after WrestleMania, and they proceeded to drag his character in the mud even more. First, he was taking a dump from my bump from my, Nia Jax. Then a series of losses to Drew McIntyre. Despite the losses, the fans began cheering more and more for Ambrose, who was still a heel at the time, which led to an unexpected face turn. WWE did this to themselves. WWE stupidly put out that press release. Said, yeah, Jonathan Good, a.k.a. Dean Ambrose, is not going to be signing with us. We wish him well and hope to have him back one day. What happened? If you let the fans know 
This guy's leaving. This guy's getting out from underneath of you. The fans were going to come back and go, yeah, this is our dude. This is a beacon of hope. He's leaving. Hopefully other ones will be able to follow suit eventually. That was the stupidest thing they could have done. They wanted to bury Jonathan Good, John Moxley, Dean Ambrose. You don't send a press release out in January that says Jonathan Good, a.k.a. John Mo- D- Dean Ambrose, is not going to renew his contract. Don't have Cole, Gray, G- Renee Young, and Graves talk about it on commentary. You do it like everyone that you have before. You don't acknowledge it. This is your own goddamn fault. God forbid, so sorry that the fans who I busted my ass for, for, ass for, for years be upset that you want to bury me on my way out. Sorry that they have had a shred of respect for me that you don't have. I get to TV and Jamie, who the producer, comes to, to me and says, you're going to be a promo with Seth. He's a heel, you're a babyface, we just switch roles, no explanation, and then the shield come, come back and we do the whole thing. Moxie said they, they caught him. Then got caught off guard again when he found himself main eventing Raw, even though he made it clear that he was on his way out. I am surprised they didn't put the that's right. I am surprised they didn't keep the Intercontinental title on him going into WrestleMania and have him drop it at WrestleMania. It's a few weeks before Mania and I'm in the main event on Raw. I thought for sure they were going to take me off TV, but Vince has to be in control somehow. He had to exert whatever control over me he could. Moxie's final match was with The Shield and was a network special built as The Shield's final chapter, yet there was a, nothing special about the pay he received for the show. You know how much I got paid for the last show I did, asked Moxley, said Moxley. I asked it. $500. I just can't imagine, I can just imagine Vince and Senior Director of Talent Relations Mark Carana like, oh, what are we going to pay him? 500 Screw him. Jericho then said, that's what you get if you're an opening, uh, you know, you're an opening match guy for NXT. Yeah, I think that's what extras get, replied Moxley. That's the minimum, 500 for a network special. Come on. Moxley has been aligned with Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns for the better part of eight years. Jericho asked him about the reaction when they found out he was leaving. They were cool. Sad to see you go, but they have been with me and watched me go through all this crap. When I told Seth, he was like, man, I'm so bummed out, dude. I said, dude, this is like the ending of Harry and the Hendersons. I'm a wild animal, and you have been eaten and have been domesticated too long. He was like, actually, that's like the perfect description. So yeah, you wanted to have Dean Ambrose go out. The Nia Jax thing was supposed to lead to a match at a house show where Nia Jax was going to go over Dean Ambrose. Sponsors found out, and they put the kibosh on it. I know a couple months, a couple weeks, I think during WrestleMania week, Nia Jax was asked about, was asked about it, and she... Said she made she made something up where she's like, oh well, I'm on total divas and we had a scheduling conflict and that's why the match didn't happen. I'm 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 happy to see that she actually tried to um, justify why they did it, but it was the sponsors. But oh my god, you had this guy say, hey guys, I'm not resigning. What does the company usually do? Like, you, like if you're leaving, anybody who comes up from NXT most outside of Oscar, Lars Sullivan, and the War Raiders. You go out on your back. You leave a territory. You go out on your back. Dean Ambrose went out on his back two or three times on Monday Night Raw to Drew McIntyre. He went out on his back. But what did they do? We have The Shield, one final chapter on the WWE Network, his last match in The Shield wins. You go out on your back. But no. We have The Shield reunion. We have to get this shield reunion one last time. We need one more shield reunion. He doesn't want to stay. We're gonna build with him. Sorry, hold on. He doesn't want to stay. We're gonna just, we're gonna milk the shield for all they're worth. That's gonna show him. We're gonna give him only five hundred dollars for his last special. Oh. Vince McMahon, you have no one to blame for yourself. This guy was the fucking heel for the end of 2018 going into 2019. He doesn't want to stay. You, dumb as fuck, decide we're going to tell the fucking world. We're going to tell the world that this guy is leaving. What did you think was going to happen? What did you think? Fans have more respect for the superstars than Vince McMahon and company does. 
I'm not gonna come. I'm, okay, everyone has to have a Triple H in his team. His team has respect for their for their for their talent. But Dean Ambrose, we had more respect for Dean Ambrose than the WWE. You had this guy go out there and look like he was supposed to job to EC3 back to back weeks. In in that week and within those two de- those two matches, they had a house show loop. And the fans were booing EC3 and cheering fucking Dean Ambrose. Whose fault is that? Vince McMahon and his stupidity ago just sent out a press release letting everyone know, yep, yep, he's leaving. Don't acknowledge it. Don't acknowledge it. No matter how many times podcasters or fans or anybody sits there and speculates, oh, Dean Ambrose is leaving. You don't acknowledge it. You just say status quo, and you job the guy out, and you go from there. But no, nope. fans turned ba- like fans turned on you. Got this guy over again as a babyface, and Dean Ambrose left. Um, not on his back, but winning and cutting a promo. Backstage talk on Talk Is Jericho podcast backstage at WWE. John Moxley just about broke the internet on Wednesday when he spoke out on why he left WWE. Going a Talk is Jericho podcast. You can read the full recap. The former Dean Ambrose talked about being unhappy with creative plans and working with Vince McMahon. He talked, he talked detailed one instance where Vince McMahon wanted to say pooper scoop on a promo. Bear in mind that this is the man it is a billion dollar company run by who allegedly is a genius. And keep in mind that we're all adults talking like this. Russell Bowe's Twitter account noted, um, uh, like I think it was on Thursday, that the sources in WWE with what Moxley said and that other people in the company are thinking the same thing. For what it's worth, I've talked to several people connected to WWE regarding to Moxley Jericho podcast. They all agree with Mox. He's not saying anything uh, that others aren't thinking. One quote I got was that it's all true. It's a mess. And it's not changing anytime soon. Vince is Vince. Vince McMahon is going to die in the chair. Whatever chair he's in, whether it's at taping, at a taping, in house, at a taping, Raw SmackDown show, a pay per view, or Stanford, Connecticut, what, or on his private jet, he's going to die writing st- writing a terrible script for a terrible show for Raw SmackDown or a pay per view. Just that's how it's going to be. And nothing, nothing, not AEW, New Japan, Ring, Ring of Honor, Impact Wrestling is going to change WWE. For anything until Vince McMahon is gone. For what it's worth, um, as another Mox interview became the most downloaded Talk to Jericho episode of all time within 10 hours. Jericho has come out, and he was on Busted Open Radio, I believe, and said more stars in WWE want to do their version of Moxley's podcast when they leave. Chris Jericho's podcast interview with John Moxley has been the talk of the wrestling world. And of his most successful show ever, the response hasn't just been great for fans, but also other current WWE talent. Jericho told us ESPN, never mind, told ESPN that other contracted stars want to do a similar podcast after they leave. He said, and I quote, I have heard from a lot of fan people who are working there say, I can't wait to do my version in X amount of months. Jericho also said those wrestlers are doing the right thing by waiting out their contracts rather than demanding a release. You finish up your work, you finish out, you do what they do what you want to do, you put over who needs to be put over, and you move on to the next territory, said the veteran. That's the best way to do business. You don't walk out, you don't ask for your release, you don't quit, you finish out the job that you were contracted to and expected to do as a professional. Once that's done, then it's up to you. You go where you want to go, and you do what you want to do. And that's exactly what Moxley did. And he seems quite un- he seems very, very happy right now. So hopefully that's an inspiration to others in the business. Um, 100% yes. Sasha Banks, I think that's why Sasha Banks ha- has had a meeting with Vince McMahon recently. I think Sasha Banks will be back. She realizes that I'm not doing this the right way. I need to come back. I need to finish out my dates whether that's 2020 or 2021, which is when she should be done, I need to go in there, work, and do whatever they want me to do. Maybe I can get one more championship run out of it if they let me, but I need to come back and do what I can do right. So, the answer is, but that is true. I know the revival. Luke Harper, for sure, is going to have that too. Um, who else? 
Mike Canellis, Maria Canellis, when their contract is up, which I believe is supposed to be up in three and up in two weeks, I believe is what it was. Two weeks from now. There are so many superstars. There's talk that there's actually superstars in NXT who went out after what happened to Ricochet and how they've been booking Ricochet after the WrestleMania and the Superstar Shakeup. Where 50 50 booking on this guy, losing the Baron Corbett, losing the Robert Roode, beating Robert Roode, losing the Cesaro, beating Cesaro. So Ricochet is a stud. Ricochet should be the future of this company. Ricochet should be the guy who is like future world champion on this brand, on this company. And he's getting 50 50 booked over and over again. And a lot of people in NXT know. They have a ceiling. In NXT, they'll flourish. Johnny Gargano and Adam Cole had a hell of a NXT takeover match last night. I guarantee you, one of the Johnny Gargano knows his ceiling is I can do whatever I can in NXT, but when I go up to that main roster, I'm going to be nothing to them. Nothing. Adam Cole, Power Rally, Bobby Fish, Roderick Strong, same thing. Roderick Strong's been in NXT for what, three years now? Four years? I don't want to see any of these guys go to Monday Night Raw or SmackDown Live. If I'm anyone in NXT, I want to stay in NXT. Ricochet getting fucked over like they, he has has opened a lot of eyes in the NXT. And a lot, it's not just the main roster anymore. It's people in NXT who realize, if I'm going to the main roster, I want out. And I'm not surprised about it. When did the WWE find out John Moxley was signing with AEW? WWE learned that Moxley signing with AEW on the Thursday before Double or Nothing. I wish I could have said they found out like everybody else because that would have just been mwah, the piece de resistance, but no. Dave Meltzer, the Wrestling Observer Radio. It was noted that WWE was not happy when they found out. You don't say. Whose fault is that? This is, this is what you get. This is what you get for treating your talent like shit. This is what you get for talent. The wild card rule has made things way, way worse. You think superstars like a John Moxley, a Revival, a Rusev, a Nakamura were, ha- were being misused before? It's now getting worse. So you're going to see Kofi and, uh, and Roman Reigns, who has been announced for Monday to go against the Revival and apparently Baron Cor- again, apparently Drew McIntyre, even though the ad said Bar- showed Baron Corbin, with his. Um, ta- his tag team of the Usos, so the Bloodline, take on the Revival and either Baron Corbin or Drew McIntyre. Roman has been on both shows for the last six weeks, six to eight weeks. That's overexposing him. WWE is just doing everything they can to keep this guy cheered, but also overexposing him to where he's not going to feel, to people who still cheer him, he's not going to feel special anymore. This shit needs to stop. WWE is going WWE is going to get so bad that nobody wants to re-sign with them. And the only people they're gonna have in a few short years are the people signed to NXT. That is it. And Roman Reigns probably. Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, who should be done very soon, hopefully. Which by the way, Brock Lesnar's cashing on a Monday, so I guarantee you he's gonna be Universal Champion going into Super Showdown. And the fan and the ratings continue to fall. Just saying. Moxley's debut has been announced. AEW has announced that John Moxley's debut opponent will be at the upcoming Fighter Fest, which will be at the end of this month. The former Dean Ambrose will be doing battle with Joey Janela. Bad boy Joey Janela, which they did in the episode, the backstage of Double or Nothing being the Elite Show episode. They did show John Moxley and, and Joey Janela. Come face to face, Joey Janela lit a cigarette, took a puff, and then you know, Moxie grabbed it, took a puff, and threw it down. So, that's what it is. Janela, after they met, met in a recent episode of Being Elite, as in AEW, has uploaded the clip on the same with Moxie and Janela. Fight of Fest for AEW and CEO Gaming will take place on Saturday, June 29th from Daytona Beach, Florida. It will air live on Bleacher Report Live at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Just Bleach Report. This is not a traditional pay-per-view. So if you're hoping to see um, Fighter Fest, it's only going to be the Bleach Report. Most likely Fight TV as well, and ITV on, in the UK, but on 
Well, but for us in the States, it's only going to be on Bleacher Report. Sales, like, tickets want to sale on Wednesday. The, fall, the other matches on this show are going to be Jabali versus Michael Nakazawa in a hardcore match. The Elite of the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega versus a mystery op- op- opponent in Ray Phoenix and Pentagon Jr. It was supposed to be Pac, but it is no longer Pac. Cody Rhodes versus Darby Allen. I'm actually looking forward to. I've never seen Darby Allen wrestle before, so that'll be awesome. And Starcast 3 has been announced for All Out. So that was all of everything for Fighter Fest. So we're going to see John Moxley debut in AEW on June 29th. But he is debuting. His, his first match post WWE will be in three days. Three days against Juice Robinson for the United States Championship in New Japan Pro Wrestling. I'm going to have to find a way to see that match, and we'll go on from there. Starcast 3 has been officially been announced for the Labor Day weekend in Chicago, Illinois. The convention announced um, a couple days ago that they will return to the city where the first, star, the first Starcast was held last year. The full details will be revealed later. Starcast 3 will run from Thursday, August 29th to Sunday, September 1st. Labor Day is on Monday. September 2nd, AEW's All Out event will take place on Saturday, August 31st for nearby Hoffman Estates, Illinois at the Sears Center Arena. There you go. All Out is going to have Starcast 3. Now, my thought on Starcast 3 is that I, I honestly think Starcast to be once a year. That's just my opinion. But if they want to do it, hey, it's all on them. I think Starcast should be tied to the if all out if it's all out, it's going to be in August, like the end of August, beginning and like big middle beginning of September every single year. If that's something we see every single year, I want Starcast to be there in Chicago every single year. But yeah, if you're going to go to all out, just let you know Starcast is happening. If you're going to Fighter Fest, that's also going to be the CEO gaming convention. So there you go. Unfortunately, it looks like Fight for the Fallen is not going to have any type of anything other than, like, no conventions or anything. We could be wrong, but we have another month and a half to go before that. Moxley says his AEW debut was bigger than winning WWE Championship. Secret and surprises are quite hard to keep in today's world of technology and social media. You're damn straight. Almost everything, every time there's going to be a surprise on WWE television, we already know it. Fans. Now, now, that's not to say WWE has had surprises before. Rock making a surprise return a couple of years ago to have a little talk off with Rusev, or during WrestleMania 30 when you had Hulk Hogan, The Rock, and Stone Cold Steve Austin all out out in the ring at the same time. WWE started to see like for them to give us surprises, but it happens. Or when Seth Rollins cashed in the Money in the Bank ladder, the, the Money in the Bank briefcase at WrestleMania 31 in the main event. That was a surprise because that was not decided until 30 minutes before that match went on the air. That was a great surprise. It happens. But AEW was able to keep the surprise appearance of John Moxley under wraps until his debut on the end of the show. The wrestling world is still buzzing about that. Moxley sat down with Flip the Strip on 804 KXNT for his first post double nothing interview. For Moxley, keeping the secret was not hard at all. He chalks it up to being professional. He said, and I quote, It was top secret. Only a select few people knew, said Moxley. It's not hard for me to keep the secret. I'm pretty good at staying silent. My ethic at, ethics as a, as a performer, even if I want to tell you, even if I know you know, I cannot tell you. I got to wait for you to be surprised. Loose lips sink ships. Damn straight. Moxley entered the arena, walking through the crowd, but much like he did in his old days with WWE, the way he described could be asserted as near out of chance. He said, kind of a blur. It was very surreal. It was a great feeling, probably the best feeling in my career. It was so the inverse of being uncomfortable in your own shoes. It was so comfortable, you almost got used to it. I had this. I had to get my bearings a little bit. It's like putting on a well-fitting pair of pants. Definitely the highlight of my career thus far. At the beginning of the BT, being the elite episode, the backstage road to double nothing, the latest episode. They showed, they showed where John, what John Moxley was doing, getting to his spot before he would go out there. And he looked like a nervous fucking wreck. Like, he looked like he was just not ready for this mentally. It, it was like, it was just so natural. He looked like he was like, holy shit, I'm about to go do this. We're about to go shock 
the entire wrestling world, and I love it. Growing up, all I wanted to do was win the WWE title, and I did that. Across the street at the T-Mobile Arena, Moxie stated, This totally trumps winning the WWE title to stand on my own two feet with no WWE involvement. They obviously made my name. John Moxie was not a famous name, but 12,000 people chanting Moxie was a satisfying feeling. Yeah, prior to you, you, prior to you being in WWE, John Moxie was not a famous name. Four minutes, five minutes in at, at the end of Double or Nothing, and John Moxley is the biggest name in the wrestling business right now, um, John. So don't call, don't sell yourself short. It took in five minutes for you to become the most over guy in the entire wrestling world, bigger than anything WWE ever had you do, even with the Shield. When he first started wrestling, he was known as John Moxley. However, once he signed with WWE. They switched his name to Dean Ambrose, but now he's back to John Moxley and is getting used to the adjustment just fine. I'm getting used to it because I was Dean Ambrose for so long. I was so weird changing my name originally, Moxley said. I was so used to Dean Ambrose, but I'm getting used to John Moxley again after a week. A lot of people still call me Moxley, who knew me before. However, you were, you were first to introduce to someone in the wrestling business. That's what you know them as. A lot of people still call me Mox in WWE. Moxley's AEW debut was one that he was most he was looking forward to. He was so amped up he worked himself into taking a nap before the show. But once he arrived, he felt the difference between AEW and WWE. Okay, I was looking forward. I was looking forward to that day for a long time. That was a long day. I woke up early, pacing around that house. I had to take a nap because I was burnt myself out with anticipation. Moxley exclaimed to Moxley. I was like, I need to take a nap. The show was just starting, and I was still at my house. I got there during the Battle Royal. I was hiding out, watching the show. It actually went by so fast. A three-hour law, especially when you're there, takes forever. You're like, oh, God, we're only on hour in. We have three hours left to time through with double and by, by with double and nothing. I said this because I watched this with my dad. I watched double and nothing with my dad. WWE pay-per-views, it's like, oh, God, it's, and especially Monday Night Raw. It's like, oh god, the first hour is just now getting done. Double or nothing. I said, I swear, I sat, I sat down in front of the TV, and by the time we got to the Young Bucks match, I was not tired. I was not exhausted. I wasn't like, uh, we still have two matches to go. I swear, every time, like Money in the Bank too, I sit there and I look at the Wikipedia page because I refresh the Wikipedia page on my phone, and I literally look to see how many matches are left. Just like, just get this show over with. Come on, just get this show over with. This is fucking terrible. I don't do that with NXT. NXT has five fucking matches, and they're awesome. Just like most of them were tonight. There was some... I don't want to say any of them were stinkers, but I'm just like, two of them were just below... They weren't, uh, like, the best matches ever. But, like, most of those matches were fucking awesome last night. So... Yeah, you could just, like, as a fan, I didn't, I've never been to a wrestling event in my life. I would love to go sometime. But just as a fan watching at home, Double or Nothing flew by. It was all, it was like 11, th I was like, I'm, I'm uh, we're at, what is it, Cody? And, we're at the Young Bucks match, and I'm looking, and I'm like, it's already 10 o'clock-ish? I'm like, 10.30-ish? I'm like, what the fuck? Damn, man, God, this day has gone by fast. Yeah, there's a huge difference. Well, now, we get to TV, and we'll say this again. When we get to TV, things will probably feel different. This was a one-thing show. I'm sure Fighter Fest, which is probably going to be like, I feel it's going to be like an NXT TakeOver type show when it comes to matches. Not, not, maybe not match quality, but matches. They're not going to have nine, ten matches for, um, fight, for Fighter Fest. Maybe they'll have like four or five matches for fight for the following. I have no idea. We'll have to wait and see. But yeah, there was a huge difference off of one show for AEW than there was ever in the last six years or five years, seven years for WWE. Moxley says Triple H should be in charge. Moxley, John Moxley's podcast story continues as he's con he continuing to be straight up with how he feels about his former employee. While talking to Pro Wrestling Torch, um, Ambrose discusses issues with Vince McMahon. He says that while he used to be a genius, he's not out of, he, he's not out of touch. In the 80s, he was a genius, said the former Dean Ambrose, when he created Hulkamania and took all over the territories. And I'm going to let you guys be clear right now. Vince McMahon did not create Hulk Hulkamania. Vince McMahon stole Hulkamania from the AWA. Burn Ganya actually 
built the foundation for Hulkamania. Vince McMahon brought Hulk Hogan over and built Hulkamania from there. So that was not a Vince McMahon bill thing. That was from Vern Vanya. Just saying. And took all, and he took over all the territories and foresaw cable television and all that. He was a genius. In 2019, I don't think he knows what the fuck is going on. I could say it even better. Vince McMahon doesn't know what the fuck is going on. Foxy went on to say that Vince McMahon needs to step aside and let someone else do it if he can't figure things out. The logical replacement is Triple H. He is being, he being groomed for the role when Vince isn't there. Hunter is the guy that you defer to. He's got good ideas. His ideas are his ideas, but he's a lot more cerebral. He's not a super open, he's not a super open collaborative. I think he would be more open to giving people more freedom, but he's smart and he sees things his way, so if he sees you doing something and, is, and he envisions a better way, a lot of the times you'll like it. You're like, oh, that's even cooler. Here's the thing. Triple H has a wrestler's mind. Vince McMahon does not. He has a sports entertainment mind. But Triple H has been producing professional wrestling in NXT for six years, for seven years. Vince McMahon has been producing, like, he hasn't been producing professional wrestling in WWE in ages. For eight, ten, twenty years, it feels like. It's all about the entertainment. But it's not good entertainment. It's Vince McMahon's entertainment, and Vince McMahon's entertainment sucks. <sighs> Back to the KXNT flip the strip in a second, but Vince McMahon has got to go. And, then, and this entire thing with John Moxley proves that Vince McMahon has got to go. It's plain and simple. He has got to go. Now, I'm sure Triple H would be more open in the mindset of things. He'll, like Vince McMahon will work more personally with superstars than Vince McMahon will. Vince McMahon will just like go talk to the writers. Go have them figure things out. Triple H is better, is better for the job, and I feel Triple H would make the shows better. But back to Flip the Strip Radio, during it, he talked about Cody Rhodes' entrance and why he joined AEW in his recent phone call from Steve Austin. Cody Rhodes breaking the stone, he thought, he thought it was awesome. What he wanted to do with that is symbolize that he is a wrestler right now and not an executive. But art is an open to interpretation. If you want him to say it was him smashing Triple H's stone with his stupid sledgehammer, then that's what it was to you. I love it. Come on, Moxley. That was 100%. It looked like a throne Triple H would be on, and he used a fucking sledgehammer. He could have used anything. He could have got a chair and hit it with a chair. He could have got a ladder, threw a ladder into it. He used a sledgehammer. It looked like Triple H's throne. That's exactly what it is. And on joining AEW, I've always been friends with Cody and Chris, a bunch of guys, there, and there are a bunch of guys I haven't met yet that I can't wait to work with. Their vision of pro wrestling is the first step for me was getting out of WWE. See the landscape. I could do independence, go to Japan, just do signings or go to places I do a DDT and get a good payday, but that isn't what I want to do. The ethos, the ethos of the place, play your music your way, was all I needed to hear. AEW is a dream, an awesome wrestling company that is actually awesome. It's a by the boys, for the boys type thing. The rest, the, and the fans, we're all on the same team. I think it's cool to be a wrestling fan again. So, exactly. AEW is for the fans, for the wrestlers. It's going to be awesome, and he's, that's why he's here. His favorite storyline as a kid. Bret Hart and Steve Austin for one. Guess who I got a call from this afternoon? Stone Cold Steve Austin. We shot the stuff for 30 minutes and had a great conversation. I grew up as a 90s wrestling fan, so any day you get a call from Austin is a really good day. He's going to do his podcast again in June, so maybe I'll get in the, uh, in, in the truck. We'll drink some Steve Weisers and we'll do that podcast. Hopefully it'll be better than the one that you did on the WWE Network because people still joke about that one. But to answer the question, it was realistic in the, in the turning point of the Attitude Era and how the fans were USA versus Canada. It was so hot and real. It was Brett, I was a Bret Hart kid, and at the beginning of this, Austin is a bad guy, but the people were cheering for him, and I was still on Brett's side. I was like, damn you, Steve, leave him alone. He also discussed he had his disguise he wore to hide before Double or Nothing. He said, I had a sunglasses, a hat, a bandit's mask. I looked like one of the LA, those guys from LAX, actually. 
I find that funny. He looked, so basically what he's saying is he dressed up like Santana Ortiz from LAX. Kind of funny. Which tells you that he also knows who LAX is, which that's pretty cool. And then he also talked about to Wade Keller about the infamous Suffering Suck Attach promo from Roman Reigns that pretty much killed Roman Reigns as a serious as serious as a serious person for a very, very long time. I think he just recovered from his leukemia thing was when the suffering suck attached thing kind of died away. John Moxley did an in-depth interview with Wade Keller Pro Wrestling Podcast to talk about his time in WWE, Vince McMahon, and the numerous other comics. Moxley spoke about length in his longtime stable mate and sometime, someone he often drove with, Roman Reigns. Moxley was asked about his polarizing fan response to Roman Reigns, sometimes something John Cena has dealt with for much of his career. He's, was, he noted it was a response that WWE was looking to change, despite fans constantly pushing back and hit back again. Well, you wanted to change that response, but yet you kept booking Roman the same fucking way every single week, day in and day out. It just, it doesn't work that way. How are we going to change that response? We're going to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Or a variation of the same thing over and over and over and over again. The fans are not going to like that. If you want to change the, the, the reception of somebody, you change the booking. You don't do the same shit over and over again. You don't have Roman go out there and call someone a bitch. And just have him go out there and just be like, Oh, you're just a bitch, and I'm going to kick your ass on Sunday. Oh, you're a bitch, and I'm going to kick your ass at WrestleMania. No. Oh, I'm supposed to be suspended, but I'm going to come to work anyway in my wrestling gear so I can get beat up by Brock, by by. Get handcuffed and get beat up by Brock Lesnar because that's supposed to be people supposed to give me sympathy. Yet, if you go back to that video, you hear people chanting, "You deserve it," and thank you, Brock. I think they definitely probably hoped that it stopped when he was in the Shield. Everybody loved him. He was the hottest thing, but was booked like a monster. That Monty said. But as soon as the fans realized that he's the guy, then they all decided beforehand they were going to turn on him because they don't like that. For whatever reason, I think Cena did the fir- did that first, and Roman walked into it. They were like, oh, it's the Cena thing again. Here's the difference between John Cena and Roman Reigns. John Cena embraced it and actually played and played to the crowd with it. He would sit there, you know, conduct the John Cena sucks chance. He would go out there and play to the crowd um, who were sitting there chanting John Cena sucks. He actually didn't care. Roman Reigns just comes out, I don't care if they, I don't care if they cheer me or boo me. I'm the guy. It was your own fault. With how Reigns has been portrayed over the years, he was asked if WWE had done it a different way when more fans have cheered him. Moxie called back to the 2015 when Reigns had to say suffering succotash in one of his promos, something Reigns tried to get cut out. I'm not surprised. I would not want to say that shit. This is not the 1970s. He's not Sylvester. He's not Sylvester from the Looney Tunes, and he doesn't have a lips. Vince had him saying suffered suck attacks. You know what I mean? I remember that day. You think he wanted to say that? No. He went and came out and was like, he wants me to say suffering suck attacks. I remember kind of laughing like, dude, you can't say that. He's like, he wants me to say it. Is it a cool way to say it? No. No, there is not. I'm like, what if you look at the camera and say, well, that wasn't easy to say or something. I don't know. His personality is so great. He's such a great dude, Moxie continued. Everybody loves him. He's the more, more lovable guy in the world. He's the guy everybody gravitates to in the locker room, just his natural charisma, but they don't let him be himself. And there's the crux of the fucking world problem. WWE has never let jo- um, Joe Anawai come out of Roman Reigns. The best characters outside The Undertaker, outside of, you know, the American Badass version, but the best characters are your own personality turned up to 11. Roman Reigns has never had his personality come through. They had taken him, held him, put him into a machine, and just built and manufactured him to be a John Cena ripoff. Carbon copy, as John Cena put it. If, he, if they gravitate to him, he's the most lovable dude in the world, and he has natural charisma, let it come out. Let the guy come out and do that. I honestly would love to see Joe on a while they go to fucking um, AEW or Ring of Honor and let his fucking personality come out because I want to see, actually, there is one promo, one promo, 
You don't have to find it, but it's NXT. It's an NXT back when Roman Reigns was a heel on in NXT. He was like, an interview. I don't remember what the interviewer's name was. It wasn't anybody who's here now. But they brought Roman Reigns in. He had a suit on. He had a watch. He had a phone. He was on his cell phone. That was the only thing I think came close to his actual charisma. That thing was like, I looked at that promo and I'm like, where the fuck is this Roman Reigns? This guy. This guy in this promo should be on Monday Night Raw, SmackDown Live on a weekly basis. Cutting that kind of promo. Putting out that kind of personality. But they don't do it because they because Vince McMahon has to control the narrative. He ha, you have he has to control each and every speck of everybody. They tried to make him years ago. He was trying to be what they wanted, and it failed miserably. He continued by saying his strong connection with Reigns and how, despite there being times where Moxie should be have been the guy, it wasn't something he would let sour the relationship. I'm really glad he is legit one of my best friends because we were riding in the car even when we were in competition, so to speak, because I loved him so much and I couldn't resent him or anything. If he was a guy that wasn't, I wasn't friends with or I hated, I would probably resent the hell out of him because there were, so, there were many times where I felt like I had, to be, I had a strong connection with the audience than him, but it didn't matter. He's my best friend, so it would have been, it would have never been come, come between us. And yes, there were times, and there's been multiple times, that Dean Ambrose, when he was in WWE, had a strong connection with the fans. I'm telling you right now that in the wrestling world, John Moxley has a strong connection with the wrestling community and the wrestling fans than Roman Reigns does. So, John Moxley, if we can take anything and everything from this entire talk of, of Dean Ambrose, John Moxley today... He has exposed, again, like all of us have all said, Vince McMahon's stubbornness, Vince McMahon being out of touch, Vince McMahon needing to be to step down and give somebody else the reins. Because Vince and Kennedy McMahon is out of touch. He will ne- nothing will change. These shows will never get better until Vince McMahon is gone. And so the only way I could see ratings getting any better, like the show's getting any better, is if the ratings bought him out and Fox threatens to, dis- like, 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 the only thing I can think of, they get you October and SmackDown isn't even averaging 1 million viewers. Or not even 2 million viewers, they're in the 1. And Fox calls them up and is like, you need to change something. Put, some, put a different writing staff together, so have somebody else do something creatively. Do something to make these changes. You have the next month or we're canceling the deal. You have four weeks to get the ratings into the twos or the threes, or we're canceling the deal. WWE has a big problem coming up in October, not just called AEW. It's called The Weekend. You know how many times when I was working at a gas station or um, uh, wrestling, uh, not wrestling, but a food like McDonald's, Wendy's or something when I was younger, and how many times people would talk about how they want to go out on Fridays and Saturdays to hang out with their friends, party and all that shit? Almost every single fucking week, you would always hear about how people want to, like, the, like the men and the girls, mostly, but mostly the girls, want to go out and party. They want to go out and have fun on Fridays with their friends or out on the weekends. Putting SmackDown on Fridays live is not, is, they don't just have AEW to worry about. They have the fact that you're trying to get tell people that, hey, don't go out and hang out with your friends. Come watch us on Friday nights. It's going to be a damn up, a bad uphill climb for WWE. And something needs to change very, very fast. Monday night had the worst, second worst, worst ratings of the year. Fourth worst rating of all time. John Moxley just went out there and exposed. I wouldn't say he buried WWE. He exposed WWE and validated Every single podcaster, every single dirt cheater, every single person who's come on here or come on to a on podcast one or busted open radio or wrestling reserve live or any other form of media and has come out and said Vince McMahon, the WWE product is stale. Vince McMahon has got to go, and any other fucking complaints. He has validated all of that. And as Jericho said, there are so many others. I'm sure Sasha Banks, Lou Carper, The Revival. Um, let me see what else here. Rusev, Lana, 
Dana Brooke, if she ever wants to leave WWE. Many, many more that I can't think of off the top of my head. Cedric Alexander, probably. Maybe um, Buddy Murphy, who hasn't been seen in a while. Even the likes of Bliss, probably. Anybody on this roster, or probably even Rollins. If Joe Arnawale left the WWE for whatever reason, would probably have some kind, not as bad as John Moxley, but would probably have some stories as well. Same thing with Tyler Black. Same thing with Heidi Lovelace. And um, Davida Rose. And Mercedes. I don't know what her last name is immediately. But those women right there, men there, Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, anybody who works for WWE's main roster right now, I guarantee you if they left, and actually, and got the got a got an open mic in front of them and told, said you can say whatever you want, they would do the exact same thing John Moxley did this week. So if we if we want to talk about anything when it comes to John Moxley, we have a couple more news stories to talk about that are not John Moxley. But I wanted to get this stuff out here first. John Moxley has come out and exposed WWE. Is it going to change WWE whatsoever? No. Is it going to hurt WWE? Possibly. I want to see what the ratings are going to be this Monday and Tuesday. Because if the ratings drop drastically this Tuesday, it's because because fans heard what John Moxley said, and he's like, you know what? I'm done with WWE. Until the day Vince McMahon's eulogy is in the papers or online, I am done with WWE. There's a lot of people going out there saying they're canceling their WWE book subscription when AEW gets TV. The, it, it, he said in that piece that I, put, I played at the beginning of the show, it's a paradigm shift, and it's coming. It's going in not in WWE's favor, and I don't think they have a solution for any anything. Like I don't think they have the solution, and I don't know. I don't care what they do on Monday night. They could put on. They could go out there and put on the best version of Monday Night Raw on Monday, and the ratings are not going to go up skyrocketing. It's going to need to take time. Rome wasn't built in a day. But they need to start doing stuff. They need to start implementing changes. Kevin Dunn has got to go. Vince McMahon has got to step down for in creative. He needs to be the guy working at working at, um, at WWE Towers. Now they can, they can have him as a consultant where he can pitch ideas. Hey, what if this works? Because Vince McMahon, I think, was the one who came up with Seth Rollins cashing in money in the bank at WrestleMania. If that was Vince McMahon, that was a hell of an idea. I'm not saying everything bad coming out of Vince's mind is going to be bad, but 99% of the time it is. He needs to be in a consultant role where he pitches ideas and they get taken under advisement. If it's something that's fucking great, then it could be shown on TV. And then, of course, they'll be like, yeah. And then you know, it's like, who came up with that idea? And they'll be like, Vince did. Oh, shit, that's awesome. But he doesn't need to be 100% in control. There are other people in this company that can help. He needs to start getting help. He needs to start being a consultant. Let Triple H and Shawn Michaels and all those guys, all the creative guys, Michael Hayes, um, Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy, when he retires, needs to be on the creative team. He needs to be the one. He needs to be in charge of a Raw or SmackDown creative team. He was the he was the brainchild behind everything they did for the Hardy compound in TNA. He needs to be on the creative team, helping these young guys, men and women, flesh out their characters. Being somebody that they can come to because he is a wrestler. This stuff needs to happen. Get guys, men and women in there who know what the fuck they're doing. Vince McMahon does not. He won't, he won't, he won't again. Things need to change. Or when October comes around, WWE is going to be in trouble. They're in trouble, they're, they're in trouble now. And I did watch on script, off the script the other day, today, and JD from m 2 6 says he has sources that something's going to be happening at All Out. That if it actually happens, I, he, that WWE is going to be in a lot more trouble than they are now. What that could be, honestly to me, I think it's CM Punk, but I don't think that's a big deal to me anymore. But whatever it is, and he's had sources before that actually were validated, so I'm going to believe what he has to say to a point. 
if it is something huge, WWE could be in a world of trouble before we even get to TNT. Moving off of everything WWE now, because we went all over that for an hour and 13, Joey Ryan, since his Lucha Underground contract came up, there has been... There has been talk from WWE possibly wanting him to come into NXT, be a part-time wrestler and a trainer. AEW, he's been on being the elite multiple times. What is going to happen with him? He did turn down AEW. Ryan's future with AEW speculated on due to his involvement with being the elite in 2018's All In event. Ryan also recently started a promoting a farewell tour to the Indies and will end those sales on Thursday, May 30th. He reportedly received the offer from from AEW shortly after being let go of his Lucha Underground contract. It was also recently reported WWE was interested in signing Ryan to work as a coach and performer in NXT. On Thursday, he appeared in the Bar Wrestling Inning promotion in Baldwin Park, California for the Pickle Pickle Jar Hero event. Ryan made an announcement that he is sticking with the independence, which in my opinion, that's good for him. He is making more money in the independence that he would ever make in NXT. Maybe he doesn't want to be tied down to a contract for a like an AEW or a WWE where he would be pretty much just stuck to them. His, his gimmick, his penis party gimmick, whatever the fuck he does, is meant for the independent scene. If he wants to retire an independent wrestler, good for him. Let him be himself. So that's Joey Ryan wants to go to the independence and stay an independent wrestler. By all means, good luck to him. Tony Khan on AEW not using scripted promos. AEW promised to be unlike any other wrestling promotion out there and started with their inaugural event, Double or Nothing. The lead up to it featured lots of social media vignettes, and that was all designed by uh, designed according to President Tony Khan. Khan discussed tapping into a younger adult audience when the joining busted open radio. It was a conscious effort, but not surprised, but but not surprised by it. Said Khan, it was been, it's been basically our audience is younger. The show was very different than our social media. This paper was not like an episode of Being the Elite, obviously. Like yeah, they want to go for the younger audience. WWE is still trying to figure out what their audience is. I like there's something about social media now where people are more engaged with their celebrities and their sports stars than ever before. People can spot a phony, and I think young people can spot a phony. I think young people can spot when people believe what they are saying and when people aren't believing what they are saying. And when I was a kid, I really did believe what Ric Flair was saying and Manny Savage and Bret Hart said in their promos. I think there has to, been, there has to be some believability. This is why a Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano feud was awesome. Yes, they were best friends backstage, but when they were out, like when that when that curtain rose and those guys were in their positions, they the promos that came out of their mouths felt believable. Samoa Joe, if it wasn't for the fact that he loses all the time, he comes out and he sounds like a savage. He's going to hurt you and maim you and beat you down. Paul Heyman sounds believable. If it wasn't for the fact that we know who Brock Lesnar is. If you first time you ever watched WWE television and you saw Brock Lesnar out there looking as big as he is, and you have Paul Heyman coming out there and saying Brock Lesnar is going to maim and to violate Seth Rollins, you're going to go, "Damn, what the hell did he do to deserve that?" Paul Heyman, believable. John Cena, when he takes a promo seriously, is one hundred percent believable. 95% like Roman Reigns, unbelievable. Can't believe a damn thing that comes out of his mouth because it's bullshit. But Dean Ambrose, in his last six or eight months, the only time that Dean Ambrose sounded believable was when, after the um, last stand, they ha- like, he caught a promo. That was the most real he sounded in WWE ever. That sounded like that came from his heart. That wasn't Dean Ambrose speaking. That was Jonathan Good speaking. When you talk from the heart, when it's not, when it's from your soul or your mind, and it's not from a script, it sounds believable. Hard Times is one of the most iconic promos ever. That wasn't a script. That was from Dusty fucking Rhodes. With a tear in my eye, I, it's one of the most iconic promos 
from WWF in 1992. That came from Ric Flair. I know I went over these earlier, but those are what they say. When Bret, when Bret Hart shoved Vince McMahon down and started saying, this is all bullshit, he was going on a fucking tirade left and right, it all felt believable because in, in Bret Hart's mind, he felt like WWF was screwing him over. You don't get those anymore. Nothing in WWE outside of NXT feels real. Adam Cole said... Uh, at the beginning of last year, that, w, that at, by the end, by, at the end of last year, at the, begin, at, at the end of this year, the Undisputed Era is going to be draping in gold. You believed it because it came from Adam Cole. When you have Mauro Ronaldo going crazy on commentary, you believe that this guy is as hyped as can be. When you hear Michael Cole on the fucking... Um, because because Mauro Ronaldo is natural. He's not scripted. He doesn't have somebody in his ear telling him what to say to a T. Michael Cole, for the love of mankind, while he's looking at a fucking piece of paper on camera. That's Kevin Dunn's fault, by the way. Con then brought up the site and used the scripted promos and wrestling and inferred that AEW will be using those very often, if at all. Hopefully, if at all. Now, now, now. If you're not good at, if you're like your promo game isn't one hundred percent the greatest, I can see why using a script to try and like bullet points is fine. But if you want to give somebody who's like a like doesn't have that much of a good speaking, can't speak real well, I can understand it. But if you're somebody like a John Moxley, you're somebody like um Cody Rhodes, Kenny Omega, Chris Jericho, the young bucks, they don't need scripts. When you see a guy reading off a teleprompter or a mental, or a metal, men, a mental pro- teleprompter, just trying to recite a script or trying to look up in the air when you forgot a line, it is hard to suspend, dis- the, suspend disbelief when the wrestler doesn't believe in the real life situation that is unfolding. So, like I said, I'm not surprised that we're drawing younger viewers. It was part of the plan going in, stated Khan. Being the elite is going to be a lot different than the wrestling show that we do, but that is the point. We are going to provide a serious sports based product from bell to bell. Along the lines of what you saw from Double or Nothing, something you are going to notice more and more is, is that things are going to take place in and around the ring where you're not going to go out in the arena, where you're not going to spend half the show backstage in dressing rooms or backstage in choreographed segments. I'm really interested in focusing on matches, and there are plenty of times outside the matches to focus on storyline advancements. We focus on the funny sketches, and we can do all that, and nobody does that comedy better than our guys. Now, backstage interviews fine as long as they're not reading off a teleprompter. If somebody want, if you want to sit there and have somebody ask a question to somebody and they can say what they actually want to say, fine. Pretty much the only people who should be scripted if at all, like with some bullet points to maybe be a little scripted is the interviewers because if it's somebody who is like doesn't like do well with asking like can't think of a question, it'd be best to script them to let them know. Hey, here's a like not a script that they have to say. It's like, like here's ten questions. Here's five questions. Ask them two of these. Ask them two of these, and there you go, and move on from there. There's nothing funnier than being the elite, but there's a time and place for it, and that is why before the Bucks and Lucha Bros went to out to set up their issue, which is really serious issue between these teams. And to go out there and have a serious, excellent wrestling match to tell the story of the issue that is taking place between the teams. That is why we weren't doing a comedy bit right before the guys went into the ring, because it was a serious match. A great match, and there's a time and a place for everything. That is why we don't have Matt Jackson make Michael Nakazawa jokes during the match, because that stuff is amazing. People love being the elite, but you also don't want to do ha-ha funny when you're doing a serious wrestling show. And we have a great balance between the two. And I think we're going to keep that doing that. A lot of the comedy that they had on the night was in the Battle Royal, where it should have been. Majority, if not all, of the comedy for the show was on the pre-show, where it could should have been, which is fine. The Battle Royal, that's buy-in, 21-man, 22-man, whatever Battle Royal, if you want to put that and make that a comedy thing, fine. Michael Nakazawa with the Bay Royal, just like, what the fuck is he doing? The Lieutenant Dan um, thing by MJF was funny. There you go. I really don't know the other way, honestly, Khan said of AEW being more sports oriented. We come from the NFL and in English football. For me, I've been to, to a hundreds of post-fights, post-match performances, 
and I really don't know any other way to be open with you guys. I've always had a great relationship with media who, ha who has covered our teams. Us as the con fan, we don't know any other way than to be open and sharing with you, uh, you guys. I really enjoy interacting with you guys, and everyone is in this post-fight scrums. We did this one, but we have also done one after doing our debut press conferences. We also gone out and spoken with the media, Cody, the Bucks, and I really do enjoy it. I think the fans enjoy it. I'm glad you guys really you guys enjoy it. Most importantly, I'm glad it makes your jobs easier because I really want you guys to enjoy it. I hope, I hope that they do those for pay per views, like fight for the fallen. They don't have to do it for um, fight fight fighter fest because that's like something else. But fight for the fallen, all out, yes, do it there. You don't have to do it after every single TV show. But for like the pay per views, which are not going to be monthly, I guess after all out, that is fine. The Smash Bros. will likely have, be using a different name in AEW because Nintendo owns the Smash, the Super Smash Bros. name. What is the great thing about being an independent wrestler is because you can use um, copyrighted music and copyrighted any way you want, and there's nothing that, that you're not going to get hit with a lawsuit. But now that the Super Smash Bros. are in AEW, their name is going to have to be changed. The group debuted at Double Nothing and over the weekend they attacked Best Friends and Jack Evans and Helico after their match. Speaking of Awesome Kong, she, her AEW debut had been planned for four months. According to PW Insider, Kong competed in the Fatal 4 way with the winner, Britt Baker, Kelly Ray, and Nala Ray. It was noted that a very small circle of people knew about the debut before Brandy Rose brought Kong out to start the match. When will Adam Chet, when Jericho and Tangman Page take place? It's going to be taking place at All Out. That is the first match on that show, August 31st, which will happen five hours after the start of, well, three hours, pretty much two and a half hours, I believe, after NXT TakeOver Cardiff hat goes off the air. So if you want to see some wrestling and you can't wait for all of things All Out pay-per-view on August 31st, Earlier in the day, at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, you can watch a um, NXT UK TakeOver Cardiff, Wales. All Out, uh, All Out takes place August 31st in the CS Center in, in Chicago. Who, what, in... Okay, we have two more, I believe. What day will AEW TV likely be on? As reported in the latest edition of Wrestling is Over Newsletter, it is looking like All Elite Wrestling won't be airing on Tuesdays after all, despite the Tuesday Night Dynamite trademark. It appears that AEW said air on Wednesdays. The decision still isn't final, but TNT is said to be strongly towards it. Addition additionally, Jason Agnew of Saturday Night Main Event is reporting that the company is in talks with the sports network to air on Canada. It's the ESP equivalent of the country uh, in the country, so it's a huge deal if the two sides come to terms. That would be TSN, which of course is the ESPN of the of Canada. And ESPN has a deal with TSN to air, um, what is it, uh, Canadian Football League games once a week on Saturdays when their season goes on. So that's huge for AEW if they hit TSN. From, from what I heard, it's not a no, but it wasn't a yes yet, so they're kind of in talks. So that's great for them, and that's huge for AEW. I know WWE used to be on TSN in Canada, but I don't know where they're at exactly right now. Definitely not TSN because TSN wouldn't be allowed to have both of them, I'm pretty sure. And finally, finally, what was the pay-per-view buys coming out for All Elite Wrestling? The All Elite Wrestling Double or Nothing pay-per-view is currently estimated to be drawing around 98,000 buys, according to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. This number includes buys from TV and digital pay-per-view with the close with close to a 50-50 split between the platforms. To compare, All In Event in 2018 reportedly drew 55,000 buys. They did 43,000 more, more than AEW and All In did. That's crazy. It is ever noted that two-thirds of the double nothing buys came from the United States, UK came in a strong second, followed by Australia, Germany, and Canada. With replay buys, Double or Nothing should top ECW's best pay-per-view, which is 99,000 buys, and become the biggest pay-per-view in pro wrestling history that's not produced by WWE or WCW. 
The Azobe noted that Impact Wrestling's TNA only did half the buys that Double or Nothing did in the 16 years, and they only did that a few times and never came close to beating that number. Regarding online interest, and this is huge, this is huge. Double or Nothing, AEW was the second most searched item on Google Trends for Saturday last week, topping 220,000 searches, only trailing the NBA's Toronto Raptors uh, match a game against, I believe, the Milwaukee Bucks at the time. All in New Japan Tokyo Dome shows and the Ring of Honor New Japan Madison Square Garden shows never cracked the top 20 trends list. WWE NXT only broke to the, the, the top 20 once when it hit 50,000 for the recent NXT TakeOver New York event. Of course, I'm recording these now post NXT TakeOver 25, so that might have changed. We'll have to keep you updated on that. The interest on Saturday night beat the last UFC show by 12% in WWE Bank by <clears throat> 35%. When it came to second day interest, double or nothing more than quadruple in money in the bank, it was no, more than six times greater than the UFC 237. That is absolutely huge. To anybody who says AEW is for the hardcore fans, that proves you wrong. 220,000 searches on Google Trends Saturday night during Double or Nothing. That is huge. Absolutely huge. Now, I'm pretty sure 220,000, I'm sure 100,000 of those was people trying to search and find the, find streaming services to watch Double or Nothing, but still, that's huge. If it was just for the, cat for the, like, they, they attracted casual fans. A lot of casual fans. 200, there were not 220,000 Searches happening with just hardcore fans. It's just not happening. The hardcore fans are not using Google to search for Double or Nothing on Double or Nothing Night. That's not happening. They're watching the show. Casual fans are like, oh, Chris Jericho, let me see Double or Nothing. What's going on here? That is huge. That just shows you how big this is going to be. When was, I wish they would show, I wish they had a date of when was the last time WWE got that high. It probably has never gotten that high. Maybe WrestleMania? Maybe? One year? But no. 220,000 searches only getting beat out by the Toronto Raptors, Milwaukee Bucks, which I believe was Game 5 or Game 6 of that, of that series in which the Toronto Raptors won and moved on to face the, the Golden State Warriors where they were up 1-0 on the defending champs. But that's not the point. This is big for AEW. Fighter Fest, I don't think we'll do this big because it's only going to be a sm it's going to be a small event. Fight for the Fallen and All Out might get this many views, but they hit 220 searches. That is a huge deal. If you don't think them get having the second most view like searches in Google Trends on Saturday night when the when the Raptors were playing, that's fucking hum that is huge. That just shows that not just hardcore fans. But even the casuals are watching. And WWE has not hit that probably ever. Because Google Trends has not been around forever. They've only probably been around for like five or six years. And I don't think WWE ever hit that high. But wow. Google Trends. 220,000 searches. Casual fans are coming around. WWE can't even keep the casuals interested in Monday Night Raw on a weekly basis. Could you imagine... If Fight for the Fallen, we get to Fight for the Fallen next month, and it's at two, it's it's the number one trend on a July afternoon because I don't think anything big's happening in July other than baseball. That's going to be crazy. I fully expect either Fight of, I don't think Fight of Fest, maybe Fight of Fest. I expect Fight for the Fallen or All Out actually trending number one on Google. People always talk about Twitter trends. Eh, not as big of a deal because people because. You could have the same thirty. You could have the same hundred fans tweeting, but you're having two hundred twenty thousand natural searches on Google. That's huge. AEW is off to a hot start. And as Brian Neville has said, if this and this, if in the long run, if AEW somehow falters and fails, if they can't compete with WWE, nobody can. This is the absolute best chance we have as an, as an alternative. And I really hope they are successful. They're off to a hot start. 
Fight to the Fighter Fest is coming up at the end of this month. I cannot wait to see what we got there. I'm looking forward to see what Darby Allen does. I've only seen the promo, the promo vignette they did for him a couple weeks ago on, I believe, a Road to Double or Nothing episode. And he just looks like, damn, I want to see what this guy can do. So can't wait for that. But that is going to be all for part two of Unscripted this week. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on Twitter and Twitch at The France Club, and I'll see you guys on Monday. Unfortunately, for Monday Night Raw, we will all expect to see Brock Lesnar become a three-time Universal Champion. Until then, my name is The France, and I'll see you guys later.